the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, The Book of the Spiritual Man, an interpretation by Charles Johnston. Recording by Maggie Russell. Introduction to Book 3. The third book of the sutras is the Book of Spiritual Powers. In considering these spiritual powers, two things must be understood and kept in memory. The first of these is this. These spiritual powers can only be gained when the development described in the first and second books has been measurably attained, when the commandments have been kept, the rules faithfully followed, and the experiences which are described have been passed through. For only after this is the spiritual man so far grown, so far disentangled from the psychical bandages and veils which have confined and blinded him, that he can use his proper powers and faculties. For this is the secret of all spiritual powers. They are in no sense an abnormal or supernatural overgrowth upon the material man, but are rather the powers and faculties inherent in the spiritual man, entirely natural to him, and coming naturally into activity as the spiritual man is disentangled and liberated from psychical bondage, through keeping the commandments and rules already set forth. As the personal man is the limitation and inversion of the spiritual man, all his faculties and powers are inversions of the powers of the spiritual man. In a single phrase, his self-seeking is the inversion of the self-seeking, which is the very being of the spiritual man, the ceaseless search after the divine and august self of all beings. This inversion is corrected by keeping the commandments and rules, and gradually, as the inversion is overcome, the spiritual man is extricated and comes into possession and free exercise of his powers. The spiritual powers, therefore, are the powers of the grown and liberated spiritual man. They can only be developed and used as the spiritual man grows and attains liberation through obedience. This is the first thing to be kept in mind in all that is said of spiritual powers in the third and fourth books of the sutras. The second thing to be understood and kept in mind is this. Just as our modern sages have discerned and taught that all matter is ultimately one and eternal, definitely related throughout the whole wide universe, just as they have discerned and taught that all force is one and eternal, so coordinated throughout the whole universe that whatever affects any atom measurably affects the whole boundless realm of matter and force to the most distant star or nebula on the dim confines of space. So the ancient sages had discerned and taught that all consciousness is one, immortal, indivisible, infinite, so finely correlated and continuous that whatever is perceived by any consciousness is, whether actually or potentially, within the reach of all consciousness, and therefore within the reach of any consciousness. This has been well expressed by saying that all souls are fundamentally one with the Oversoul, that the Son of God and all sons of God are fundamentally one with the Father. When the consciousness is cleared of psychic bonds and veils, when the spiritual man is able to stand, to see, then this superb law comes into effect. Whatever is within the knowledge of any consciousness, and this includes the whole infinite universe, is within his reach, and may, if he wills, be made a part of his consciousness. This he may attain through his fundamental unity with the Oversoul, by raising himself toward the consciousness above him and drawing on its resources. The sun, if he would work miracles, whether of perception or of action, must come often into the presence of the Father. This is the birthright of the spiritual man. Through it he comes into possession of his splendid and immortal powers. Let it be clearly kept in mind that what is here to be related of the spiritual man and his exalted powers must in no wise be detached from what has gone before. The being, the very inception of the spiritual man, depends on the purification and moral attainment already detailed, and can in no wise dispense with or curtail them. Let no one imagine that the true life, the true powers of the spiritual man, can be attained by any way except the hard way of sacrifice, of trial, of renunciation, of selfless self-conquest, and genuine devotion to the wheel of all others. Only thus can the golden gates be reached and entered. Only thus can we attain to that pure world wherein the spiritual man lives, and moves, and has his being. Nothing impure, nothing unholy can ever cross that threshold. Least of all, impure motives, 
or self-seeking desires. These must be burnt away before an entrance to that world can be gained. But where there is light, there is shadow, and the lofty light of the soul casts upon the clouds of the mid-worlds the shadow of the spiritual man and of his powers. The bastard vesture and the bastard powers of psychism are easily attained, yet, even when attained, they are a delusion, the very essence of unreality. Therefore, ponder well the earlier rules, and lay a firm foundation of courage, sacrifice, selflessness, holiness. End of introduction to Book 3 of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, The Book of the Spiritual Man. An interpretation by Charles Johnston.